Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Audrey, a recovered alcoholic. Hi. I want to just start off, um, <laughs> my God, what an honor it is to get to come and do this. Um, I just didn't really realize what this was going to feel like. You know, um, we, Julie, and I have, Julie and I have had the opportunity to, to speak at, at some different meetings and do some different things at different places, and it's always a fun, it's a hoot. Um, but I, I tell you, i got to be honest with you, I was a little overwhelmed um, by the welcoming that we found here in California. I was Julie was on her knees praying in the bathroom like a good drunk, you know. Um, and I went back in this this cafeteria and um, just kind of, kind of got overwhelmed with gratitude. And I'm starting to tear up and I'm on my knees and I thought, God, somebody's going to walk in and see me, you know. One of the speakers is losing it, you know. <laughs> I was like, you know, trying to pray, but look out of the corner of my eye, make sure y'all weren't, you know, crazy, crazy people stuff. Um, but I just, I just can't tell you enough um, how honored we are to be here and to be a part of um, not just this workshop, not just this thing, but this fellowship, this program um, is a huge deal. It's a huge deal. Now, I wouldn't have told you that six and a half years ago. You know, I wasn't delighted to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Not my story. Um, So I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about me, just a little background and um, kind of qualify myself, and then I'm going to tell you um, what's happening in recovery. Um, I am... um, I'm from East Texas originally. I'm from Sulphur Springs. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. Um, but it's a little podunk town in East Texas, and I love it. Everybody wears cowboy boots. There's fireworks going off on the square. You know, everybody goes to Grandma's house. I mean, that's just kind of the deal. And, and I was raised in a, in a small town by two absolutely adoring parents. Could not have been there any more than they were. You know, it, it was like that. Um, I would later spend a... a, a, a <laughs> substantial amount of time in therapy trying to connect the dots of why I drank because it had to be my parents' fault, you know. And in, in looking back, it's just like, wow. I mean, I really didn't even have a lot to work with. You know, they were just so phenomenal. Um, my dad is an alcoholic, and so I did have that to kind of go on. Um, but but really not much else. I had a great childhood. I was, I was different. I was not um, a pretty and pink princess. I just, I've never been that girl. Um, I wore camouflage from the time I could pick my own clothes. I wore high-top Converse. I did karate. Um, I climbed trees. I slapped boys. I, I did stuff like that. And I was just different. And that was so okay. You know, and then they're, they're you know how you are when you're a kid. You're just kind of uninhibited about stuff. And there, there came a point where I had some awareness. You guys know what I mean by that? Where it's like you start to really have a heightened sense of awareness and begin to notice things in your interactions and begin to change. And I began to notice that I um, I was off. I was just kind of off a little bit. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't, you know, there wasn't something wrong with me. I just, you know, mildly uncomfortable all the time, <laughs> you know. There's a woman that I know that I've met recently, and she she best described the spiritual malady in that way. She said, I've been mildly uncomfortable my whole life. And I said, brilliant. That's the smartest thing I've ever heard. It's the best way I've ever heard it described. And I was just a little off, and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. And um, so I, I excelled in sports. I excelled in school. I excelled in karate and softball and basketball and volleyball. I, did tra- I mean, you know, I was that kid. Um, they didn't have blackberries back then, so I don't really know, even know how my mom kept up with me. But I was, you know, the kid that would, you know, fly the bird and, you know, just do weird stuff like that where you're like, that's a kid, that's weird. You know, I was just a little off. And, and it was fine for a while. You know, it was fine for a while. And going up through grade school and going up through junior high and stuff, I never could just seem to get it right. And I always felt like people expected something different from me. And I'm a lot like Julie in the fact that I've made every decision in my whole life based on fear. I ran on what you thought, and I could be anybody you needed me to be. So I began to to change. I began to alter um, that unique, cool little kid that I was. Because I was. I was kind of a badass for a little kid. Sorry, we're recording. We'll edit that later. Um, But I really was kind of a neat kid, and I began to alter who I was based on the perception I thought you needed me to have. Um, And I I would do that until the time I got sober. And what a sad way to live, you know? What a sad way to live to not be you. 
it's it just uh, so sad. Um, I would later come to learn that those were about stage characters. And um, that was about defects of character. I didn't know that at the time. You know, at 10, I wasn't like, I really hate that I have to play the stage character. I, d I didn't understand. I just was like, this sucks, and I guess I need to be prettier. I guess I need to be more in pink, or I guess I need to be, you know, a better baseball player. Whatever you need me to be. I'm that girl. Are you like cheerleading? I love cheerleading. I hate cheerleading. But if you need me to like it, I'm going to like it. You know, and then something happened to me. When I was 14, um, my dad was the, was the kind of drunk that would sit on the couch and drink a case of beer, and he was very calm. He was funny. He was not a problem to me. Um, but as his alcoholism escalated, it became a problem in their marriage, you know. And, um, and he was the guy that um, everybody loved him, but they would go, oh, Mr. Mr. Chapman, yeah, mm, yeah. They felt sorry for him. And, you know, as a kid, when you realize somebody feels sorry for a parent, that does something to you. You know, and I made a mental note, I will never be like that. Now, I love my dad, and I love him more today than I ever have in my whole life, but I didn't want to be him, and in the sense that I didn't want to be a drunk, you know, and that will be important later on in my story. I remember finding a, a diary. I've told this story a million times. Um, if you guys are like me, you had a journal when you were a kid, but it wasn't like a, just a blank you write in there what you did that day. It was like a question journal. It's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? What kind of man do you want to marry? What do you want your job to be? Um, what's your goal? And under what's your goal, I wrote to not be an alcoholic. Guys, I'm six years old. That's not normal. But I was crystal clear on the path I didn't want to take. And so I, I demanded from a small child, I'll do it different. Do it different. And so I began to morph into whoever you needed me to be, and, and alcohol was clearly a no-no. And I remember thinking, why doesn't, he, why doesn't he just stop? You know? I mean, my mom's a phenomenal woman. I'm a cool kid. Why doesn't Daddy quit? You know, it's a it's a heartbreaking thing. I wasn't angry with him. It was just it was so hurtful. You know, so I just I always sympathize with, with all the Al-Anons in the, in the room. I've, I've got I'm the child of an alcoholic and a sister to two drug addicts, and I hate Thanksgiving. You know, it's like I get it. There, I understand that feeling of if, are we going to set them off? Is something going to happen? I get that, um, and I grew up with that. And so by the time I hit 14, something really really good happened to me, and that was tequila. That was the best thing that ever happened in my whole life, because the internal discomfort where I couldn't stand to be in the same room with you, not about you, it wasn't personal, I just couldn't be, had no tools for living. Um, I got in the back alley with, with a little boy down the street and my stepsister and uh, with a bottle of tequila and, and some other fun stuff, and, and I'm telling you something, that liquor hit the back of my throat, and I went, you remember that when you caught your breath? It was like that. It was like that. And it registered. That's not normal. <laughs> you know? It registered. Do this as often as possible away from mom. <laughs> you know? <laughs> One track mind. You know? And, and that's what I proceeded to do as often as I could. Problem is, I had, I had problems getting along with people. Um, not because I'm mean, but because I just, I didn't have any tools for living. I literally did not know how to interact with other humans. I got real weird. And, and alcohol was a solution to all of that. It just shifted internally where I went, ooh, I'm okay. And I got, I didn't get along with, with the girls in school, and so I got sent to a private Christian school. It's real hard to do that kind of stuff in a private Christian school. And so um, I did what I could do, and I tried to walk the line. And, and I've always tried to walk the line because my mom is one of those people, right, you know those people, that um, can do anything. They're amazing people. You know, she's got a master's degree. She was in the Miss Texas pageant. She's that girl, right? And then there's me, and I'm on the scene, like, ah, you know, just all over the map. And she's like, contain yourself. You know, it's always, you know, if y'all were like this, I mean, it didn't matter. It didn't matter who got screamed at, whose butt got busted, who got, right? It didn't matter. Put your Sunday school shoes on and put that smile on your face and let's go. And that's how I was raised. And so I, I knew crystal clear not to show anybody else out here what was going on. I learned that at a very early age. I don't blame that on my mother. It's how she was raised and how her mama was raised and we're from the south and that's how it rolls. We're, Put that smile on, darling. We're going. You know, and so I did that. Um, and so when, when I found alcohol, everything shifted inside and I got real okay with something. And, and that was me. 
suddenly I'm okay standing where I'm standing, interacting with you, being who, it didn't matter. I'm talking, I'm flirting, I'm telling stories, they're lies, but I'm talking, you know, and I, I didn't know how to do that stuff. And so when I, I went to this private school and, and found that I wasn't going to be able to do that, and I've always been searching. You know how you've just been searching? You don't know what you're searching for, but by God, you're searching. You know, and I think inherently we all know that there's something spiritual that we're trying to connect with, but we just don't know how to do it. You know, so in high school, I was in this private school, and um, I joined all the Bible studies, and I went to the, you know, early morning prayer groups, and I got super religious. So I was like, that that's it. You ever seen those kids? They're happy. They have a sense of purpose. They're walking a path. And I went, maybe there's something to that. Let me shift it over here. I was constantly trying to shift those gears. And when I'm unhappy, here's what I do. I change everything out here. I change the people, the setting, the degree program. That's a fun one. Anybody else in here take longer than eight years to get a bachelor's? I'm curious. <laughs> you! Winner! Love it. Right? Oh, I've got to change everything out here to get okay in here. And I tell you what, it's weird how that cannot work so many times and you do it anyway. It's like everybody around you is going, it's not that. It's you. But you don't see it. And you're going, it's not me, it's you. You know, that was the constant face interaction that I have with my family members. And um, so I decided that, you know, Jesus wasn't the way after all. Um, you know, and, um, and I, but I, I knew that I needed to get away. Let me get out of Denton, which is where I was from. It's about 30 minutes north of Dallas. Um, let me go to Arkansas. Because that's a, that's a plan, you know. It's not a good one, but it's a plan. And, um, and I've got some friends from, from school, and they're going to go up there, and, and we're going to go to this, this school, and we're going to be about school, and we're going to be college students. I'm going to have the experience. I'm going to get it together. Um, because alcohol was a problem in high school. Um, and so, and I always wanted to drink a little more than you did. You know that girl, right, the one that you, you walk off and she's taking an extra shot? That's not about a party. That's not about fun. That's about trying to satisfy a craving within my body that I didn't know I had. I really didn't. I thought, God, that's weird. The other girls are drinking a couple, and they look real cute, and they're having fun, but I'm loaded in the corner and don't care to speak to you. (laughs) You know, that was my story. So I went off to the school in Arkansas, and um, a Baptist university, that was not a a good choice, but um, not a good choice, but it was a choice. And um, and so um, I'm up there, and I'm having to sneak off campus just to smoke a Marlboro. You know, I'm like, oh, this is not going to work. I just I can't quite get in the groove with you normal people. I just can't seem to walk the line. I don't understand what it is, but I'm frightened of everything and everybody. And I'm trying to pretend like I don't care. I got this. And the truth is I'm, I'm so frightened and fragile and broken. If you'd have tapped me, I'd shattered on the floor. That is so sad. But that's alcoholism, right? That's the deal. So I, I convince my family one more time. I'm a big convincer, you know. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. I will hook you in <laughs> to my plan. So I'm like, I need to come back to, to Texas. I need an apartment. I need to go to junior college. University life is not for me. Da, 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 da. I proceed to do this a number of times. Um, my grandfather, who is salt of the earth, the hands down best man that ever walked the earth, he, cut, he says, if you'll come home, I'll build you a house. I'll pay for your education. Just get it together. I'll, I'll do these things. And I went, you know what? That's the right thing to do. You know, so I go home, and, and I'm living in this apartment. This house is being built. I begin to work at a, a daycare. I love kids. I love kids. Um, it's difficult to sweat out bourbon while you're chasing three-year-olds, so you know what I mean? It's like, oh, that becomes a problem. But I fall in love with this particular little boy named Hayden. Um, adore him, and I'm keeping him after after his daycare, and um, I'm trying to get some credits going at the junior college, and I'm like, it kind of pseudo looks like I've got a life going on, like for a 19-year-old kid. It kind of looks kind of cool. Um, but the truth is it starts getting weird again, and I stop going to class. And I don't want to work anymore. I want to keep this little boy because I love him. I mean, honest to God, love him. Um, but but I stopped doing normal people's stuff. You know what I mean by that? I stopped paying bills. You know, and then nobody's watching me. I'm a big advocate of, of solitary living, where because if people aren't around, that's not a problem. Right? You don't shower, nobody cares. You don't buy groceries, nobody's the wiser. I'm a huge fan of living alone and being a hermit. Um, and so, it's Julie laughs because it's so true. <laughs> but um, 
so I'm doing this kind of stuff and I'm trying to hang on to this thing of a life and so I'm like okay the house is built let me get out of this I'll I'll live with a couple of guys you know because that's a, <laughs> not a good plan but it's a plan you know so I get a couple of guys that were real rowdy in high school and real fun and this you know I'm just not having any fun in life I'm, I'm too responsible. I'm going to school and I'm working. Well, that's not even happening, but that's a delusion in my mind. You know, and so I live with these couple of guys, and it gets real rowdy real quick. You know, they're, they're the kind of guys that they're growing stuff in the attic. You know, women are coming in and out. There's naked people sometimes. There's a third bedroom that, that we don't want to know what goes on in there. You know, the police are watching the house. It's like a situation, you know. And uh, it's a situation. And um, my stepdad said to me one time, I came in, I said, Ronald, here's the situation. He said, Audrey, why does it have to be a situation? <laughs> Because it does. Moving on. But um, anyway, it's like a whole big deal. You know, there's there's all kinds of stuff running in and out of my house. There's things that are very inappropriate going on. And my adorable grandfather is devastated. You know, um, it's, it's a brand new neighborhood. It's like one of those little starter home neighborhoods where they all kind of look alike. Um, people are growing flowers and like there's little kids running to the school bus. And Audrey's half naked in the front yard, you know. And there's beer cans everywhere and my truck's parked next door. And it's like, it's just stupid. Like how many chances can you give a kid and watch them go, mm. you know, it's really, Audrey? And that became the kind of theme in my life where everybody looked at me and went, Really? I, I don't, I can't do it differently. I mean, I'm talking about I've lost the power to live like a normal person kind of stuff. And so I changed degrees and schools again. And, and I'm telling you, um, it got so weird that the boys had to leave. You run off some young boys, <laughs> you know, what, what was funny at first about I can out drink these big football players. It, it ceased to be cute. I became a problem in my own home and they were like, okay. So they're gone. I'm living alone. And um, and my dad, who was, had been sober from the time I was, I guess, 10 to 17, he did that whole charter rehab thing where they feed you vitamins and tell you, don't do that no more, you know. And so he did that deal. And then he came into AA and did some bunch of half-measure stuff. He didn't know there was a book. Like, wow, that's what that looked like in this little small town in East Texas. Um, I remember that conversation calling from rehab and going, Daddy, there's a book. He's like, a book? You know, like, <laughs> shit. You know, it's just like, wow. <laughs> it got real weird. But anyway, so I'm living alone in this house. And um, I don't know if anybody else lived like this. Maybe you guys were functioning real well. But um, I stopped turning the lights on. You know what I mean? The glow of the television light was the only one that came on. I start waking up at 5 p.m., going to bed at 5 a.m., running in the bars, causing all kinds of situations and happenings, you know. In Denton, I mean, the, if you ever drank in the loophole in Denton, Texas, God bless you, you know. Um, I, I run in with people, I don't like you. I mean, like, I don't hate you, but I sure don't like you. But we're drinking together every single day. What's that about? Audrey can't be alone. Because if you're alone and you're drinking, that looks real alcoholic, doesn't it? It's like, hmm, let's that's a problem. But if you're with a bunch of people, you can pseudo make it look social. And so I'm running around with these people that I cannot even stand, you know. Bad things start happening. Um, my, I remember one time my mom picked me up at the Denton County Jail, and it was like a real embarrassing situation where she pulls up in a Hummer dressed to the nines, you know. I come out, I kid you not, in a pair of flannel pajama pants, no shoes, a bright orange T-shirt that says, have a nice beer. Right? Like, my hair's, like, all to one side. I'm 100 pounds overweight because I'm a beer drinker. By God, I'm from Texas. I mean, it's disgusting. You know, most girls in their early 20s, they're real concerned about their bodies, real concerned about their looks. Not me. Not me. I'm stretch marks. I've gained so much weight. It's disgusting. I'm not even embarrassed to tell you because that's just what's up. That's what it looked like. I'm vomiting everywhere all the time. I'm urinating every, like a dog, like all over the house, right? I remember when I got home from rehab, and my, I said, this is, the mattress has to go. And my mom said, can we flip it? And I was like, Mom, three years urinating on the mattress. No, we can't flip it. It's got to be burned. You know, like that's, it was, it's, I make jokes about it because to me it's funny today. Let me tell you what, that was my life, and it was the most pathetic thing I've ever seen. It was pitiful. I'm driving around night after night after night after week after month after year alone in my pickup truck, throwing beer cans out, smoking cigarettes, listening to sad music, crying. 
You know, lots of you guys have these awesome party stories. I so don't. It was just pitiful. I began to plan my funeral. I have a flair for the theatrics. <laughs> but I planned my funeral, and I remember picking out funeral songs and stuff, and they were, like, so sad, you know. And I remember I played them for this, this guy friend of mine, and I was like, these are the two songs that I want played at my funeral. And, and they were all about how nobody loved me when I was here. They didn't get it. I was misunderstood, you know. <laughs> it's like the stamp of a martyr. <laughs> no one got me, you know. <laughs> No, because you didn't want to be gotten. You you ran from everybody. I, I lived that way. Come here, stop. Come here, stop. You know, it's like I was so frustrating for the people around me that I became a drain, and I never wanted to be that. I remember there was a guy that was taking his girlfriend back to the back room in my house or the back bathroom trying to show her where something is, and she walked in, and she goes, oh, my God. And he's like, I know. And And I'm standing outside the door, and my heart went... You know, I was pitied. That very thing that I saw in my father that I never wanted to be, they said, what's that smell? And I heard him whisper something, and she goes, oh, that was my life. You know, I make a lot of jokes about peeing all over everything, but, you know, that's humiliating to do that every single day, you know. I um, And my dad and I began to drink together, which was, was a really fun time in life. My stepmother really didn't appreciate it at all. We drank together, and, and um, my dad was one of those drunks that, that when he got bad off, organs began to fail. You know what I mean? He began to bleed out of orifices of his body. He was rushed to the emergency room. In Sulphur Springs, they told him, Mr. Chapman, don't you ever come back in this emergency room again. We're not going to revive you not one more time. That's what it looked like. But to the outside, you ask me how I'm doing. Hey, it couldn't be better. Things are great. Right? No job. No school. No friends can't stand to be around my family because it's just too heartbreaking the way they look at me like, God, you're a nuisance. We love you, but God, you're a drain. It's a hard thing to watch your family members look at you like that. I remember my mom having little um, parties and get-togethers with really nice people. And I would come, you know, stumbling in the back of her house. I didn't even live there. But I'm going over there to get for food because I can't go to grocery stores. I stop going in public because I can't look at you because you might see and if you talk to me, I could die. You know, I could die. I found a little convenience store where you could drive through and get your beer and your cigarettes. I wish I could remember his name. He was the deal, right? He would have that case and that pack. Just, he knew I was coming. And that became my life, you know. I remember one time I went to the University of North Texas to enroll in school, and um, I had gotten so weird at that time. Some of you just have a little drinking problem, not this kid. I'm, I walked onto that campus, saw the amount of people, freaked out, and left, and just went, I don't even, I don't need a degree. Never mind, you know, because I can't even be around you, because I've become such a sick person. I am. Um, my father had consequently at the same time gotten just as bad off and surpassed me as he does. Um, and uh, I had a dream that he came to me and he said, Audrey, I'm not going to live very much longer and I just need you to know, you know, I love you. I just need you to know I love you. And I woke up and called my stepmother, which I never do. And I said, Where, what's going on with dad? What's the deal? And she said, Audrey, we're over in Baylor Hospital. I was going to call you this morning, but he's shutting down. They're, they're reviving him. And I remember going over there, and he was dying, literally, of alcoholism. And I remember thinking to myself, if I ever got as bad as you, I'd quit. <sighs> 22 years old. I'm there. It's, it's saddening, you know, but I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. Um, so he goes home, and, and I, in my infinite arrogance, go home to do an intervention on him. Wow. You know, what was I going to tell? I drank with him, number one. Like, he knew <laughs> the secret. Nobody else knew what was going on. They knew something was wrong, but they didn't know what it was because I didn't come around. I began to live like a bat. I just came out at night for the liquor. Um, and so I went home to do this intervention on him, and I never will forget, he wasn't drunk. We couldn't figure out what his deal was because he was checked out, but we couldn't smell any liquor on him or anything. But I remember going back to the back bedroom. It was clear we couldn't do an intervention because he was, he was out of his mind. And he was standing in front of his mirror, and he was doing that, you know how we – do that sway, and he was talking to himself in the mirror. It's the same stuff I do, you know. And I remember him reaching down, and he picked up something, and he said, let's do it. Like that, he had a relationship with him and him alone. 
Like that's alcoholism. That's the sadness. That's the pain. If you're not one of us, by God, bless you. You never have to know that. That's the pain, you know. And I remember looking at him and thinking, not that liquor's going to get me soon. It was, but I was too delusional to see that. The fear wasn't that I was about to die. The fear was I would live. He was 50 at the time, and I thought, if I have to live until 50 the way I'm living, shoot me. I'd rather die. And I got in my car, and I spun out and went on the back road smoking cigarettes. And and I remember I called my mom, and and they had a a love affair that never ended. They were soulmates. It's it's very saddening. And she said, how's your daddy and what happened at the intervention? And I said, Mom, I'm an alcoholic, and I need some help. And as soon as I said it, I went, Oh, dear God, and tried to, you know, like, reel it back in really fast, you know, but she's got a heightened sense of awareness, and she was on it, <laughs> on it. That's my mother, Mickey. Oh, my God. She's a hoot. She's like, I want it. So she's calling my lawyer, calling my probation officer, calling, you know, she's like, this is what we're doing. But she goes, here's what I need you to do. Don't drink and come home. Come home, and we're going to figure this out. So I immediately get loaded, you know, like, oh my God. And um, the fear of never having another drink terrified me more than dropping dead right at that moment. You know what I mean? It was like that. And so I go back to Denton and she's like, here's what we're going to do. Um, we, we, we're going to go to treatment. And I was like, we're going to have to, because I can't separate myself from alcohol, not for a day, not for half a day, not for nothing. I can't separate myself. And so I'm, like, going through my phone, like, who do I need to call? Nobody. (laughs) There's nobody to call. That's a shocking moment, you know. Um, There was a couple people that I let know, the little boy that I kept and loved and adored. I called his mother and said, I've got to go to rehab. And she said, you know when I knew something was wrong? When you would keep my son in that filth that you were living in. Because I know you love him, Audrey. I know you do. But you kept him in filth. And I just... You know, everybody else I called and lied to and said, my dad's gotten really bad off in his alcoholism. I'm going to take care of him for 28 days. Don't call my phone. It won't work while I'm out there. You know, I've been to his house a million times over the years. My phone worked. They knew it. They're smart. They put two and two together. You know how you tell lies and you're like, that's a solid one. I got it. (laughs) They're all like, duh. You know, you're so stupid. No, anyway. My mom drives me down to um, a treatment center in the hill country, and I'm detoxed, and um, she's giving me sleeping pills so I can sleep at night. And, and um, But I don't drink on the way down there because I didn't know you could show up to rehab a load. <laughs> I was pissed when I got there. People were stumbling in, and I was like, oh, I went two days with her without a drink. Because um, when on the way down there, she said, Audrey, I think this is going to be great. You're going to be able to connect the dots and understand why it is you drink. And I'm looking at her like, I know why I drink. Looking at it. Because you wanted me to be somebody I didn't want to be. And you left my daddy because he's a drunk. And that's why I drink. You know how it is. You got a host of reasons. And not only do I have alcoholism, I've got depression. I've got anxiety. I've got family dynamic problems. I've got uh, 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 all this stuff. And I showed up down there and um, and I remember uh, I don't cry in front of anybody for nothing. I do today. I cry a lot in front of a lot of people all the time. But then I didn't cry ever. It was real bizarre. Like, I mean, I didn't cry in front of people at all. And um, I remember when I saw the taillights of her, her Hummer leave this treatment center, and I'm crying to the intake nurse, you know, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, doing all that. And, they, you know, they heard you in. They're like, hey, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, let's go, you know. Join your community. Um, get out of the office. Um, and so... I did not know what I was in for, but what happened is I met this gentleman named Chris that, that had this, this book, and I had heard of a big book. My probation officer said, Audrey, you need a sponsor in a big book. And in my infamous smart aleckness, when I'm sponsored by Jack Daniels, and, you know, I'm envisioning like a giant book, like a, you know. And so he was in there with one of those little ones, and I was like, this makes no sense. I'm lost. I don't know what's happening. And, and I remember I sat in the back, too, um, not because I was angry at AA, because the only experience I ever had with AA was I went to two court-ordered meetings. And then I figured out, wisely, that you can sign your own paper. <laughs> no need to go. So I had some weird experiences in AA. I didn't hate it. I just went, eh, it didn't work for Dad. It's not going to work for me. It's weird. Those people tell funny, funny stories. I don't get it. And so I wasn't really there for AA. I was there because I didn't know what else to do. You know what I mean? Like, 
that was the only option I had. And he began to talk about um, the steps in the program of action in a way that I had never, ever heard. He talked about freedom from sickness. Not just about not drinking, but freedom from, from sickness, from bondage of self stuff. And I thought, God Almighty, that's interesting. I mean, I, I don't even know what to say. I began to move up like row by row by row. Then I didn't care what you thought. I'm like highlighting, underlining, like a pin behind my ear, you know. Like I'm into, I'm in it to win it kind of a deal. But I, the, the, the higher power thing made me antsy because I had already loved Jesus at one point. And, and so I didn't understand how we were going to line that up because I'd already done that. And if that was the deal, what's the point? You know, I got loaded around that stuff. And, um, and what I found was that while I knew a lot about God, I didn't, I didn't have a connection to the power of God. And that's what the program gave me. That's the cool stuff. You know, he gave me Julie's number. Actually, another gentleman gave me Julie's number when I left treatment. He said, call this lady. She's awesome. She's in your area. She can sponsor you. She'll be great. And I was like, okay. So I got back, and I heard her speak in a meeting, and I thought, hell no. <laughs> no. Listen to her foaming at the mouth, acting crazy. No. I'm like Angie. I'm like, I'm trying to shimmy over here, you know. <laughs> scared of her. And the truth is, I wasn't scared of her. I was scared of the power in her. I didn't know what it was. I'd never touched it. I'd never seen it. I didn't know, I didn't know anything about it, you know. What I was taught was act right. She was she was doing something else. She was seeking the power of God, and it was evident, and it frightened me. And so I do what, what I do, which is I don't say anything about anything. I'm kind of doing my own little thing, trying to hang out in the fellowship, doing some meetings and smiling at you and hugging because that's what y'all do. And um, that was really uncomfortable. Everyone hugged. It's like, God, this is awkward. But um, at six months sober, I was so crazy from not working a program that I couldn't decide if I should drink and continue to go to AA or just drink and go away. Anybody else been there? Or you were weighing it out? And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to die. I got in front of Julie. I rang her doorbell one night about 1030 at night. She's married. She has four kids. She has stuff to do. But she answered the door. And let, and let me go on her back porch, and, and she opened the big book with me. And she did something that I never thought would happen. She connected. You know, and for a girl that could never connect with anybody, especially female, anybody to connect, my God, what a gift. What a gift. We stay up to 4 o'clock in the morning to do my third step. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. You can go to all the meetings you want to. You can quote the book as much as you want to. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. On the porch, 4 a.m., on your knees with a broken girl. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. She taught me what that meant. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm highlighting what you're highlighting. I'm parroting what you're parroting. I didn't know. And that, that wasn't about anything other than I didn't know. Right? My unwillingness to submit to a will other than my own. She taught me what that meant. How do you do that? You know, I um, I worked the steps in a matter of I think two weeks. You know, she gave me the four step papers. I'm two days later. Hey, what's your schedule? I need to do this. I, I'd never done that before. I stalked her for years, really. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Paul was like, "Who is this girl? Why is she always at my house?" You know, but God bless you, Paul. <laughs> he let me be there all the time because she showed me. She got me in front of a group of people. I remember one time we were down at a reunion at this treatment center, and um, <laughs> there was an open mic, which Julie will run to. She can't wait to tell you about how much she loves Alcoholics Anonymous and what a past program this is. Me, I'm the girl that shuffled into AA with a ball cap on and would pull it down over my eyes so you didn't see me. I didn't talk to you. I didn't do stuff. I remember when she made me um, be a greeter at the door. I was like, let's review. <laughs> I don't like people. I, you know, and she doesn't say anything. She just look at you. <laughs> Fine. You know, I remember being out there. There was hundreds of people. There's an open mic night, right? And by this time, my dad's decided he should stop drinking. <laughs> it's gotten that bad. So he's on some dry time on the grace of God. And um, we're sitting out there, and she goes up there, and she gives one of her rah-rah. Like, it was awesome. I was like, that's my sponsor, you know? <laughs> Awesome. And um, she sits down, and, and I won't repeat it because we're on, we're on tape, but she said, get your up there. And I was like, Exc 
what? Me? I looked over at my dad for support, and he's like, ooh. You know? like, the gods turn their back on me. They're like, you're with Julie. You know, and I was like, oh, my God. And so I go up there. I mean, my whole body, I suffer from anxiety like you wouldn't believe. My whole body is vibrating, <laughs> you know. I, I can't even function. And I get up to this mic, and I talk about the power of God in my life. And I walked away, and I've never been the same. She pushes me to do things I don't want to do. Not because I don't want to do them, but because I'm frightened. Because self-reliance causes fear. And fear causes more self-reliance. And more self-reliance causes fear. And she just snatched me out of that cycle and urged me to do the things that I need to do. She's put me in front of more groups and more people. And guys, I'm the kid that walks onto UNT campus and goes, never mind. The very thought of having to raise my hand when you call roll is enough to make me quit the course. Right? I graduated from North Texas. I have a degree today because that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is. Right? My family is phenomenal. The relationships that I had with them, that's Alcoholics Anonymous. My dad went through the steps, got sober. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. That's not because I'm awesome. It's not because I'm a good person. It's because that I submitted to a program. Right? And here's the thing. Three years ago, my father died. Three years ago, last week. You know? Accidentally. Tragic death. Never once did I think about a drink. Never once. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. See, I won't, I won't stand here and tell you that it's all skipping through the sunbeams with Jesus and AA. It's not. We have life. We do. My sister nearly died. We nearly lost her in the ICU. Guess what? She picked up a year chip last week. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. Guys, it's not all about fun and game. It's about being able to live life, not on life's terms, on God's terms. There's oceans of difference between those concepts. Oceans, right? That's Alcoholics Anonymous. And if I hadn't been shown a way, I wouldn't know a way. If you're sitting in here and you don't have a sponsor and you don't know what I'm talking about, please don't leave not knowing. It's the saddest thing in the world. You know, a couple people earlier got up and and said, you know what, this isn't for us. We're going to go. I I wasn't angry. I wasn't upset. I thought, oh, God bless their hearts. Bless their hearts, they don't know. And they're not going to know until we get in this literature and talk about what this is about. See, I'm not the kind of sponsor like Angie will attest to that will say, you know what, baby, you do it your way. It's fine. I love you anyway. Won't. We're going to do this or I'm going to tell you to go away. That's the kindest thing in the world I would ever do for you. You either take these steps or go away. Don't sit in this fellowship and wither. Go get that bottle. Get to getting on. When you get done, come on back. And we've got a solution that works. And if we didn't, I can attest to you, nobody in this room would be here tonight. We'd all be, I don't know, at the corner bar <laughs> together, right? But because of this program, it, it, it unites us in a way that, that nothing else could. Nothing. I remember thinking my mom used to make, try to make me be friends with people in junior high because I was so weird and awkward. And she's like, I swear, don't come home today without two girls' phone numbers. You need to find some friends. You need to. It was like dating for junior high. I was like, I don't like people. You know, she's like, you've got to find some friends. But I was such a freak, you know, just out of my mind. And I couldn't help it. I didn't know how to not be that way. You know, I was sick from a very early age. This bonds me. I have women in this room that I'm telling you what, jump in front of a train for like that. I don't like people, and I love drunks. Right? That's my story. I, I'm two years out of a relationship. I don't need a man to complete me. I'll be damned. Right? See, Alcoholics Anonymous didn't just provide me some awesome stuff. It gave me the power to walk away from the stuff I didn't need. Let me tell you what, that's a gift. That's, it. that's the stuff people don't talk about. Right? I didn't have to drink. Great. Neither did my grandpa. We're not giving him chips. What's really going on? Right? Where are you with your creator? That's what I need to know. You've got 17 years sober? Cool. Not, don't really care. Where are you at with God today? That's what I need to know. Does that make sense? I, I, it's time to wind it down. And, and I just, I gotta tell you, I don't know y'all, but I know y'all. You know, it's pretty cool to be able to walk into a room like this, and I couldn't, I couldn't name half of you, but I know you. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.